Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name's Anna Frith. I'm a solicitor here at Hampson's. We are a firm specialising in health and social care law. And we're going to have a look today at witness statement writing, have a look at some top tips for preparing statements and some pitfalls to try and avoid. So I will hand you over to Jennifer and she's going to run through our agenda for today. Thanks, Anna. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us today. Um, as Anna briefly mentioned, um, we're going to cover um, statement writing today. Um, we'll initially be discussing why statement writing is important. Um, we'll be going through the content of um, statements that you might be asked to prepare. We'll be giving you some stylistic points and we'll be addressing the different forums that you might be asked to provide a statement for, for example, a complaint as part of a clinical negligence claim or um, uh, for an inquest. Um, we'll be taking you through the process of preparing a statement and we'll be addressing issues of disclosability. Anna's going to um, be talking about reflective practice, as we know this is um, an area which is a bit of a hot topic and um, which you might be um, preparing statements for in the future. Um, we'll be running through some case studies to um, give you some examples of good and bad practice in terms of statement writing. And we'll be leaving you with some top tips at the end of today's session. So I'm just going to pass back um, to Anna now to discuss why statement writing is important. So if you are asked to prepare a, a statement, it's really an opportunity for you to provide your side of the story and to explain what has happened. It's your evidence. It's likely to be signed by you. And it may ultimately be the evidence that you give to court. Often, if you're asked to provide a witness statement, it may include a statement of truth, which means it is equivalent to giving evidence on oath in court. So as you can see, if you are asked to prepare a statement, it is important that it's correct because it is or can be formal evidence. It can also be quite strong and persuasive evidence, a good statement which is logical, which addresses what has happened in a step by step manner and takes the reader through the context and the background can be quite strong evidence and it can be helpful and persuasive. And it can be that a, a good, strong, detailed statement which essentially fills in the gaps could sometimes be the end of the case. If you are ultimately called to give evidence in court, having a detailed statement can make that process easier for you. It's something that you can refer to in court and you can use that to refresh your memory and to fill in what has happened. Preparing a statement is also a good opportunity for a reflective practice for your own development. Um, so that you can have a think about what has happened. Just a couple of notes of caution. It is important if you're asked to prepare a statement to make sure that it is right the first time. It can be quite difficult to correct a statement, particularly in civil proceedings. The court may not give permission for any further statements to be served. And even if the court does give permission, it, it may not <clears throat> excuse me, necessarily create a good impression if you do need to serve a further statement, either clarifying something in your original statement or giving further evidence. Also, when preparing a statement, do be aware of who may end up reading your statement. It may end up being disclosed further than you anticipated at the time that you prepared it. For example, if you're asked to prepare a statement as part of a complaints investigation, it may be the case that a claim is made sometime later and your statement as part of the complaint will end up being disclosed in that claim and will be seen by everyone involved in that claim. So be cautious if asked to prepare a statement, but it is also OK to be sympathetic and empathetic, but just be aware of who may ultimately. So I'm now going to pass back to Jennifer to have a look at a bit more detail and the content of statements. Thanks, Anna. So when asked to prepare a statement, um, I know it might sound um, quite simplistic, but you really need to make it clear um, your name and your um, professional address at the top of the statement. 
we'd recommend that you use the hospital address, hospital address rather than your personal address. And it's a good idea to include your qualifications and your current role. Now, if your role was different um, at the time of the events that the statement relates to, it's important to confirm that in the statement and to explain that you're now in, in a different role. Um, it's also really helpful to set out at the beginning of the statement the purpose of the statement. So um, if you've been asked to provide a statement for an inquest or to address a complaint or in response to a clinical negligence claim, make this clear at the beginning of the statement. And then in the body of the statement, include your factual account of the events. Um, it's really important to stick to the facts to try and avoid making assumptions or guessing or speculating. Um, and we recommend that you um, include any supporting documentation that you refer to um, within your statement. And um, this could be extracts from medical records or um, data on staffing numbers. And at the end of the statement, you need to sign it and date it. And then in terms of stylistic points, um, the statement should be able to stand alone. So whoever picks up the statement should know who you are, why you're providing the statement and the facts of what happened. Um, it's quite a simple point, but it's really important to number your pages and your paragraphs. It allows for much easier navigation for you and the reader of your statement. It's also really important to explain abbreviations. Um, now, we appreciate that um, you use abbreviations in your every, everyday practice, but remember the reader of your statement, be this a judge, um, a coroner, a patient, their family, they will most likely be a lay person and so they may not understand the medical terminology that you're referring to. So it's just really important to include a definition. And if you're referring to test results as part of your statement, then it's very helpful to put these into context. So whilst you may know that um, a certain um, BP result means something, it's, it's really helpful to say to the reader that um, this, this was normal or this was alarming or this was reassuring. It just puts um, the, the information into context. Often you'll be asked to, um, to prepare your statement on trust headed paper, which um, you can obtain from the person who's asked you to provide the statement. And um, we often get asked whether it's appropriate to um, include an apology or condolences um, in a statement, which it definitely is, um, because you need to remember that an apology is not the same as a formal admission of liability. It's absolutely fine to say that you're sorry that the patient was not happy with the care they received or pass on your condolences if a patient has died. Um, an apology can actually go a long way, um, especially in statements provided for an inquest or as part of complaints procedure. So we're now going to have a look at the different forums in which witness statements can be used. I'm going to have a look at criminal matters and clinical negligence claims and Jennifer will cover inquests, complaints and the court of protection. So firstly, looking at criminal matters. These are generally quite rare, as I'm sure you will appreciate. If you are asked to give evidence in a criminal matter, the statement will normally be taken by the police, generally by the investigating officer and generally at a police station. It's quite a tightly controlled process and the officer will control the issues that they want you to address in the statement. They will lead you through the statement step by step to cover the points that they would like to be discussed. It is, however, still your evidence and your account of what happened. It's likely if you do find yourself in this situation, you will have a representative either from your medical defence organisation or a solicitor with you. Generally, in criminal matters, statements are taken very soon after the incident, but that's not always the case, for example, if an incident has come to light years later. Disclosure of statements in criminal matters is very restricted and you should not discuss or share the content of your statement outside of that statement process. And if you were to do so, you could risk undermining a criminal investigation, which could potentially be a very serious matter. So moving on to clinical negligence claims, these are civil cases, so they have a different procedure to criminal matters. 
generally, if you are asked to provide a statement in a clinical negligence claim, the statement will be prepared by the solicitor who is acting either on your behalf or on behalf of the trust in the case. They'll normally set up a meeting with you and will go through the background to the case with you and the points that are to be covered in the witness statement. The solicitor will have an eye on the allegations, on what the claimant is, is saying and on what needs to be addressed in the statement. So the solicitor will help you with the format and the points to cover. But again, obviously, it's your evidence and it's your opportunity to get across what happened. In terms of the statement itself, it will be a signed statement of your evidence and it's the evidence which you would give at trial. It's known as evidence in chief, so it stands as your evidence. If the case does get as far as trial, your witness statement is your evidence and you can then be cross-examined on it at trial. So clearly it's your account and it needs to be truthful. It is important in your statement to discuss the facts of what happened and not to give opinion. There will be independent experts instructed in the case and it's their role to give an opinion on the case. So your statement should stick to the facts of what happened and not give an opinion on the merits of the case. It's okay if you need to explain why you did something as to what your opinion was at the time but you should, just shouldn't be given your opinion on the case itself, on the allegations that are being made. As Jennifer mentioned earlier, statements may have supporting documents either copied into the body of the statement or annexed, annexed to the statement. This could be extracts from the, the medical records, it could be medical literature, or it could be a local trust protocol if that is relevant to the statement. The statement needs to cover all of the facts and it needs to tell the story chronologically and concisely. It can be quite time consuming preparing statements, particularly if there is a course of treatment which needs to be discussed. But it is important if you're asked to prepare a statement that you do give consideration to those points and that you check any statement prepared on your behalf carefully. As I mentioned earlier, the statement will be verified by a statement of truth, which is equivalent to giving evidence on oath at court. Most cases don't get as far as trial, but sometimes they do. And if you're asked to give a statement in a case, ultimately, you may be asked to attend court to give evidence. This would mean that you could be cross-examined on your statement at trial, meaning that you would be asked questions on it. You may be asked to explain the points of it. As I mentioned earlier, you can't generally, once a statement has been served, you can't add to that statement. So it is important that the statement is right the first time and all of the relevant information is, is in it to start with. There is a process by which the parties can ask the court to give permission to serve witness evidence, but the court will not always do so. And as I mentioned, even if it does, it may not create the best impression. It may well be the case that a statement is taken sometime after events occurred. It's not a memory test. If you can't remember something, it's fine to say so. And it's also perfectly acceptable to set out what your standard practice would have been at the time if you can't remember the detail of the patient. Before making a statement, it's a good idea for you to just have a think as to whether You've provided any previous statements, for example, as part of a complaints process, or whether you've provided any other documents or been involved, for example, in an investigation process, which may have been disclosed. Normally, disclosure of statements in clinical negligence claims are limited to the proceedings themselves, so only those people involved in the claim will see the statement. But that can be quite a large number of people, such as the claimant, their solicitor, their independent experts. So it may be the case that your statement will be seen by several people. So I'm now going to pass back to Jennifer, who is going to have a look at complaint statements and inquests. So you might be asked to um, provide a statement um, for an inquest, and this is um, 
this is more common um, that rather than being um, asked to provide a statement as part of a clinical negligence claim. Um, the, you might be asked to um, use the, the trust template. It's likely you'll be contacted by the trust legal team um, who will ask you to provide this statement for the inquest and um, they will be able to provide you with a template. If they don't, then please do ask for one. Now, disclosure of a statement that you prepare for an inquest may not be limited to the inquest. Um, it may then be disclosed as part of clinical negligence proceedings. Um, both Anna and I um, predominantly deal with claims, and we often do see um, claims which um, there has been in which there has been um, an inquest previously. Now, inquest statements um, are very useful if a claim is subsequently brought because they do provide information as to what happened. They help us identify the key decision makers and therefore um, from whom evidence may be needed in a civil claim. And they also act as a really useful aim, aid memoir if you are asked to provide a statement in a claim, um, which I think, as Anna mentioned, can often be brought several years after the events, whereas a statement that you provide as part of an inquest is often prepared very close to the time of the events. Um, a good statement in an inquest um, may mean that you don't have to actually attend the, the inquest to give evidence. The coroner has the ability to accept evidence under Rule 23 of the coroner's rules, which means that your evidence is read out in court and is accepted into the proceedings without you needing to attend, um, which therefore avoids um, any stress that's related in actually um, attending the inquest. You um, may ask to be uh, to provide an overview statement for an inquest. Um, this is often the case when um, there may have been um, staffing issues, for example, and you may be a, a senior nurse asked to, um, to comment on the number of staff on a particular ward on a particular day. You need to make it clear um, at the outset of your statement that you are providing an overview statement and that you weren't actually um, personally involved in the, the patient's care yourself. And this will therefore set the parameters of, um, of what you can comment on within your statement. Then moving on to statements that are provided um, as part of um, complaints and incident investigations. Um, please don't underestimate the purpose of statements um, asked, uh, asked for as part of a complaints process. These statements um, are vital to ensure that an incident is properly investigated and to help decide if further escalation is required. Statements for complaints can um, help fully address a patient's concerns at a really early stage and avoid any further action um, being taken. Um, again, Anna and I um, often see um, as part of a complaint Sorry, part of a claim um, that it has started life as a complaint. And it might be that something that was said as part of the complaints process has actually fueled the subsequent claims. So it's really important to make sure that um, a statement provided um, as part of a complaints procedure is factual and correct and um, it is given the, um, the proper consideration that it requires. Now, in terms of the disclosure of statements for complaints and incidents, um, this um, can be disclosed quite widely because it can um, be disclosed as part of an inquest or, like I said, it can be um, disclosed as part of clinical negligence proceedings. So, um, as we've, we've been saying um, throughout the session today, it's really important to keep the statements factual wherever possible. Now, Anna's going to, um, to talk now about um, reflective practice. So, I'm just going to touch on reflective practice. The picture there is from a guidance note on the GMC website on reflective practice, which sets out in a bit more detail a few of the points that I'm going to discuss. As I'm sure you're all aware, um, reflective practice is required as part of ongoing development and the intention of reflective practice is to learn from it. It's a tool for you for your own development. So the purpose of any statement or note prepared as part of reflective practice is different. The focus is not necessarily on the facts of what happened, but instead on what can be learned from it and whether things would be done differently in the future. The issue of whether reflective statements can be disclosed is a bit of a grey area and we would say essentially it depends on the circumstances. The general rule for whether a document 
risk should be disclosed as part of a legal claim is whether the document is within the party's possession, power or control. So, for example, if a claim is brought against a trust, it's unlikely that any reflective notes would be within the trust's control because they would probably remain within the individual's control and the trust may not be aware of them. However, the position is less straightforward if a defendant is sued in their personal capacity, for example, a private surgeon. It may then be argued that a reflective note is within the defendant's possession, power or control. I have to say that we don't routinely find that reflective notes are requested when we're dealing with claims, but that's not to say that it isn't an issue which may arise in the future. It is also useful for us uh, when dealing with cases to know whether a reflective note has been made and if the decision has been made as to whether things should or should not have been done differently. Our advice, if you receive a request for disclosure of a note, is to seek some advice because the circumstances are different in each case. And if you receive a request, our recommendation would be that you should seek advice either from your employer, if it relates to a trust, um, from your medical defence organisation, or you should seek legal advice. Um, in terms of disclosure of reflective notes in relation to GMC investigations, um, the GMC don't require disclosure of reflective notes, but it would be up to individuals to decide whether they might want to disclose those as part of their defence. So we're going to move on now to have a look at some case studies. Thanks, Anna. Um, so I'm going to take you through um, the first case study, which is um, a, a statement provided as part of a complaint. Now, I am aware that some people um, are attending today's session on the telephone, so they won't actually be able to see um, the slides that we've got up on the screen. So what I'll do is I'll just briefly um, take you through um, the content of this statement, because then I'm going to talk about the, the good and the bad points um, from this statement. So um, this is, like I said, it's a complaint statement provided by um, Rain or Shine and um, Sorry, it's, the, it's been provided by Lasagna, but it's been requested by um, Ray Norshine. Um, I apologise for the, the names used in this statement. I think they're, they're trying to add a bit of, of humour to, to quite a dry, um, a dry, a dry area. Um, so Les has provided this statement. He's a catering supervisor at the Trust. He's confirmed he's been um, in this role for two years and two months, and he's worked at the Trust for five years. He's been asked by the customer care team to put together this brief statement in response to a complaint made by a visitor to the, the canteen, Tina Beans. Um, Tina sent a letter of complaint to the Trust um, about the way she was treated on the 31st of July. Um, Les confirms that on that day he was working from 10 till 6 p.m. on the lunchtime service, which was short-staffed. He um, explains that they've been short-staffed quite a lot recently in the canteen due to sickness and also due to recruitment problem within the trust as a whole. He sets out in his statement that he saw Tina order a meal from the counter, which was a jacket potato. She was passed her plate by his colleague, um, Marsha Mallow, and the potato rolls off the plate and onto the floor. Tina put the plate back on the tray and as she bent down to pick up the potato from the floor, her shoulder caught the tray, it tipped and the plate fell on the floor and it smashed. He then says he didn't actually see what happened next because a number of people crowded around Tina and the plate. He was about 10 metres away from where Tina was standing. However, when the people cleared, he could see Tina again and he saw there was blood on the floor. Uh, Les then left uh, the canteen to go and find the first aid box and notify the cleaning crew. He then says in his statement that he wasn't sure what happened in the interim, but he thinks that his colleagues would have asked Tina to sit down and would have cordoned off the area to prevent any further injury. And the matter would have been raised as an incident. He thinks that the whole thing was an accident and he's very surprised to hear that it's resulted in a formal complaint. He expresses his opinion that flip-flops are a strange choice to wear in a hospital canteen and um, the incident was not due, in his opinion, to the carelessness of your colleagues. He understands that Tina has asked to be refunded the cost of the potato, which he doesn't think is appropriate or deserved, um, as the NHS is struggling enough as it is. 
So just looking at the um, the good and the bad points um, in that statement. So um, some of the good points are that Les, um, it sets out his name, his role, the date and purpose of the statement at the beginning. He sets the context and he provides relevant background information. Overall, his statement is fairly factual. Um, he confirms why he was asked to provide the statement and he includes the relevant information. Now, there are some bad points um, or some, some points to avoid um, in this statement. Les um, includes assumptions about what happened when he wasn't present and what could have, so what would have been done. This isn't factual information because obviously he did not witness this firsthand. He didn't actually see the incident, so raises the question of whether he's the best person to comment or obtain a statement from. Um, if you are asked to provide a statement and you don't feel like you're the best person, but you feel like perhaps a colleague might be, it's always important to, um, to let the person who's asked you to provide the statement know that because um, it's important to get the statement from the, um, the people who are best placed to provide it. And in this statement, Les also offers um, opinions such as flip-flops are a strange choice and he didn't think the, um, the refund was appropriate or deserved. Um, he also makes um, unhelpful um, comments such as, um, I was surprised to hear that this resulted in a formal complaint. So it's things like that which you, you need to avoid when you're providing a, a witness statement. I'm going to have a look at an inquest statement. It's quite a brief statement, so I'll just run through it to start with, um, just for anyone who doesn't have access to the slides. So the statement reads, this report has been prepared consulting the case notes, as I do not have any recollection of this case. Prior to my initial and only involvement, there had been other pedi paediatric surgical consultations with colleagues. I saw the baby on 17 January 2016 at, and then there's brackets where it says Donna, Please review notes, insert time, close brackets, with the paediatric surgical registrar on call on Ward 3, neonatal intensive care unit. The reason why I was asked to see the baby was to rule out any potential general surgical conditions as it was reported to have abdominal distension. After assessment, there was no obvious abdominal distension or apparent surgical issue at that time. Therefore, there was no indication for surgery. And the statement then ends. So the first point to make is that this is a statement for an inquest. It's clearly a case with very sensitive circumstances and we would recommend when preparing the statement just to consider those circumstances and to consider who is going to read the statement. It's not a self-standing statement. It, it's clear that it's a statement for an inquest but the context of the statement is not particularly clear. It's not immediately apparent who is providing this statement, although it has been signed by a consultant paediatric and neonatal surgeon. It would be useful for them to have set out at the beginning who they are, what their involvement was and why they're providing the statement. The background to what has happened is also quite difficult to understand. The surgeon says there has been other paediatric surgical consultations it would have been useful to have a bit more detail as to why, as to what was going on, what the backgrounds were and why those consultations were required. There's also some factual information missing. Um, it's clear from the, the first sentence that the surgeon doesn't have any recollection of this case and it seems that they've asked someone to check the notes and to add some detail, but that hasn't been done. So it appears this statement hasn't been proofread particularly well. The detail of what was done is also missing. Um, the surgeon says that they carried out an assessment. That raises the question of anyone reading the statement as to what that assessment was, what the finding was and what those findings meant. The statement says there was no obvious surgical issue. It would be useful to have a bit more detail on what the findings were and um, whether they were reassuring and just really the, the context of what was happening at that time. And as I mentioned earlier, this is an inquest statement, um, the, the circumstances will be sensitive, and we would suggest that some of the language used in this statement may not be entirely appropriate. So overall, there are some points on that statement which we would suggest could be improved and a bit more detail 
would go a long way to explaining what has happened. So moving on now, I'm going to have a look at a court of protection statement. Um, so for those who can see, um, this is a formal court document. Um, it's been set out with the case heading, the claim number, um, the names of the parties involved. It's set out at the beginning, there's an introduction from the person giving the statement. She says, I'm the court of protection lead for the trust, explains that she's authorised to speak on behalf of the trust in these proceedings and gives a bit of background to her role and why the statement has been given. This statement is in relation to the management of a patient's diabetes. The first part of the statement refers to exhibits which are extracts from the medical records. The latter part of the statement then summarises the, the points arising from those records. So this statement says, it's clear from the attached blood sugar measurements that the diabetes is relatively unstable. The current care team have altered the regime several times and they understand that the patient's blood sugar may also alter daily due to factors such as anxiety, non-compliance with medication, physical health and meal refusal. The statement goes on to state, I understand from the current care team that the patient continues to refuse to accept any responsibility towards his blood sugar and maintaining a suitable level. It's clear from the attached documentation that the patient requires a robust care plan in relation to his diabetes management. So looking at the positive points from the statement, it's concise, it's clear why the statement has been given, and it gets across the points that the writer wishes the reader to take from the statement, which is that the patient is not accepting any responsibility for his blood sugar maintenance, and that a robust care plan needs to be in place. We would suggest there's probably a bit more detail that could be given. The first few paragraph refers to medical records attached as exhibits. It would be useful to have just a sentence or two summarising what those records say or what the key points from those records are. At paragraph eight, the writer states that the management regime has been changed several times. Again, it would be useful to have a bit more information about this as to why it has been changed, what changes have been made and with what effect. And again, paragraph nine could have a little more, little more explanation. It says the patient isn't accepting responsibility. It would be useful to know a bit more information on this and on what basis that is being said. Um, for example, if there are any relevant parts of the records which back up that assertion, it would be useful for them to be referred to there. But overall, this is a reasonable statement, but a little more detail would be useful for the reader so that they can understand what is being said in a bit more detail. So I will now pass back to Jennifer, is going, who is going to have a look at some tips for statement writing. Thanks, Anna. We just want to leave you today with some um, top tips from the session. Um, so things to remember are if you are asked to provide a statement, um, confirm the purpose or the audience of the statement at the outset. Be this a statement provided for an inquest, as part of a complaint, as part of um, a claim or for criminal proceedings. Um, make sure you answer the question. It might be that you're asked to provide a statement in respect of care provided between two particular dates. Make sure you stick to that period and that you cover all the issues that you're asked to address in your statement. Um, check what relevant documentation is out there. Um, it's absolutely fine um, before providing your statement to, um, to request, for example, a copy of the um, complaint letter. If you are providing a statement as part of a complaint, this will help you um, understand what the, the patient is complaining about and um, address all the issues in your statement. Make your sources clear. Um, as we've said, it's it's fine to um, exhibit documents to your statement, um, and that's really helpful because it sets out to the reader where you've taken the information from. We often do see reference to um, to trust guidelines, and it's um, it's really helpful to to have a have a copy so the reader can see them at the same time as as reviewing your statements. 
um, keep a copy of any signed statements. It might be that you um, are asked to provide a statement for an inquest or as part of a complaint, which you then prepare and submit. And then it might be some time before you hear anything further. It's really helpful if you keep a copy of your statement so that should any further action um, be required, you're able to review that statement and refresh your memory of what you said. Um, as Anna's touched on, um, changing a statement is really tricky and it is um, to be avoided. Um, you need to get it right first time if at all possible because um, it's difficult to change a statement and it doesn't give a very good impression because it, it um, gives rise to questions as to um, why the statement was inaccurate in the first place. And always remember to um, stick to the facts and to try and avoid offering any opinion. Um, as Anna said, um, in a clinical negligence claim, there will be experts providing their opinion, so you're not required um, to include this in your, your report or your statement. Um, then we have now got some time for some questions. Um, so, um, Jess, if, I think have we had some questions? So, um, we've had one come through. Um, if someone writes a reflective note as part of their appraisal process, could a trust need to disclose that? It would very much depend on the circumstances, unfortunately. Um, there isn't a sort of yes or no answer to this situation. Um, Generally, we're not seeing requests for disclosure of those sorts of documents, but the law in this area isn't particularly settled and it is still developing. Um, so I suppose it's not impossible. Um, it's something that the circumstances would need to be considered um, in each case. So uh, I'm afraid I can't give a more definite answer, unfortunately. Um, but if such a request is made, we would recommend seeking advice at that time so that the circumstances and the merits can be considered in greater detail. Okay, thank you, Anna. Another question um, regarding health statements for child protection. Is, is this the court of protection and what particular information is required? Any that is not relevant? Um, I think in terms of, of statements um, for child protection, um, they would be via the, the court of protection in most circumstances. Um, with regards to the particular information that's required, obviously it will depend on the circumstances. The um, best thing to do would be to check with whoever is asking you to provide the statement what um, facts they require. Again, it might be that this needs to address care provided between a particular um, between particular dates or particular period or um, one particular attendance. So um, it, it's difficult for us to say you know, if anything is not required because I think, um, as I say, it would definitely depend on the circumstances, but you would be very much within your rights to, um, to check with the person who's asked you to provide the statement before you prepare it to ensure that you um, know exactly what you're um, required to comment on. Thank you, Jen. Um, another question. Can you refuse to make a statement and under what circumstances? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to take that. Um, I've had this situation um, fairly recently um, in one of the claims I'm dealing with. And yes, you are entitled to, um, to refuse to provide a, a, a statement. Um, however, um, the, the court does have the ability to witness summons um, someone to attend court. And so if a claim did end up at trial and the um, one one or both of the parties considered that the, the witness, um, their evidence was important to the case, or if the, the judge themselves um, considered that it was important to hear from this witness, they can um, witness summons you um, and you would then be required to, the formal um, order requiring you to attend court. Um, it, in that circumstances, you wouldn't have obviously provided a witness statement, but you would then just be asked questions um, uh, by, by the judge or by both parties um, at, at the trial. Um, obviously, it's slightly different um, in um, a complaints process or an inquest. Um, in an inquest, again, the, um, the coroner can request that you attend the inquest to answer questions um, if you are refusing to, um, to provide a statement. So it, it, it's to be avoided, but if you have um, you know, reasons to 
um, to not want to um, to be involved in a matter, then obviously you just need to discuss that with the person who's asked you to provide the statement or with the trust legal team. And they should be able to um, to answer any questions and to um, to help you. I mean, it might be that you're um, you're anxious about providing a statement and they can definitely assist with that. Thank you, Jen. Um, another question. Are medical staff involved in preparing court of protection statements? Um, I'm happy to deal with this one. Um, yeah, yes, they can be depending on the, the circumstances and as to what exactly a statement, what exactly is required in the statement. Um, again, um, it is all fact specific and it will depend on the circumstances of the case as to who is best placed to provide a statement. Thank you. Um, Another question, um, how much detail should we include regarding previous consultations from colleagues, as in the paediatric surgical example? We wouldn't expect the, the sort of facts of those consultations to be included, um, but in the example that I talked through, it appeared to be relevant that there had been previous consultations. So if at the time that you carried out your consultation you were aware that there had been previous consultations it may be appropriate to include a line or two explaining that there had been previous consultations and the reason why it just helps add a bit to the background and to the context of the case um, just so that the person reading the statement can understand what was going on at that time and it can sometimes be the case that having the detail in the statement at the outset reduces the number of questions which may arise from that statement. Thank you, Anna. Um, next question. If you're asked to complete a statement by your manager for an inquest and you've had minimal contact with patient and your colleagues are more appropriate to complete the statement, who would you raise this with uh, within the trust? Um, I'm happy to take this one. Um, you, I mean, you could discuss it with um, your manager in the first instance, and then either you or your manager um, could discuss that with the the trust legal team. So, um, inquests sometimes they're dealt with um, by the the trust solicitor, and sometimes the the trust will um, instruct external law firms such as Hensons um, to represent the trust at an inquest. So, um, it, it might be that you you end up needing to speak to um, for example, a solicitor from Hempstons, but the most likely circumstances is that you or your manager would um, speak with someone within the trust legal team who would then be able to, um, to review the position and consider whether your colleague would be better placed um, to provide a statement for the inquest. And the only issue is that sometimes the coroner does request inf um, information or a statement from um, a particular person. And so I um, actually um, did a comment as um, at the um, head of legal services at one of the um, Northwest Trusts and I did often go back to the coroner and explain that um, the person that he'd requested to do the statement from was actually not the best placed person to provide the information and so that sometimes is required and depending on the coroner they um, are sometimes willing to um, accept that explanation and to um, to accept the, the alternative statement from the, the more appropriate colleague. Thank you Jen. Um, next question. If errors in treatment have been made by you or others how do you deal with these in, in a statement? Um, I'm happy to cover this one. Um, if, if that is the case, the facts of what have happened would need to be set out in the statement. Um, as we mentioned, the purpose of the statement isn't to give an opinion on what's happened. Um, it, it's to discuss the facts. Um, so we would still need to explain what had happened and why. Um, and it would then ultimately be for the, the experts uh, instructed in the case to give an opinion as to whether that was correct or not. Thank you, Anna. Um, next question. Uh, what are the consequences of missing the deadline to provide a statement? I think that depends on the purpose of the statement. Obviously, if it's for, um, for example, a complaint process, that's an informal process that's managed by the trust. 
So um, there may not be um, a, a kind of formal consequence of missing a deadline. Um, it may just be that um, you obviously have then um, someone um, asking you to provide this as soon as possible. The, it is important to comply with any deadlines that you are asked um, to provide statements by, but um, the consequences are maybe not as serious as um, in illegal proceedings. And um, so in cases that Anna and I deal with, the court will set um, a directions table, timetable, sorry, which um, sets dates by which certain actions have to be taken, one of which is um, the disclosure of, of witness evidence. Now, we can apply for extensions um, for these dates, but if we do not serve um, the witness evidence by the time required by the court and we haven't um, obtained an extension of time, then it may be that we're not relied, sorry, we're not allowed to rely on that evidence because we haven't given the court any good reason why we haven't been able to comply with that deadline. So if you are providing a statement, especially if it's for um, a, a, a clinical negligence claim and you are struggling to, to comply with the deadline that's been set for you, um, please do um, give the person who has asked you to provide that state that statement good notice and they should be able to take the required steps to obtain an extension if needs be. Thank you um, everyone for attending today. Um, Anna and I um, will be happy to take any um, questions either via telephone or via email so please do give us a call or drop us an email if you, um, if you think of anything after the session.